Our text this morning comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 17 and verse number 11. Leviticus 17 and verse number 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Under the Old Testament, fleshly Israel offered bloody sacrifices to atone for their sins. They offered lambs and calves and doves and pigeons. Things that in the animal world are considered quite docile, gentle. And thus here in the mind, if it worked as it was meant to in the mind of the one offering the sacrifice under the law, they would be thinking that this innocent animal dies because of the sins I have committed. And thus they pointed the way to the Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and would keep them uh, sharply mindful of the fact that this animal, a dove, a pigeon, a lamb, a calf, was dying because of what they did. That's one of the ways that the law was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. And, of course, God accepted these blood sacrifices upon the principle that life is in the blood. However, God wouldn't allow the Israelites to drink blood or to eat it as pagans did all around them. And many people still, especially in Europe, do today. And again, the reason for this was because life was in the blood. Under the New Testament system, the blood sacrifices of animals are no longer offered. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 10 of that letter and verse 4 writes, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So in the place of those animal sacrifices under the old law for the Jews, we have today offered under the New Testament the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and it was offered once and for all time. And we in each worship assembly on the first day of the week according to the authority of Jesus Christ, the head of the church, we remember his death in the prescribed ways we did a moment ago in the Lord's Supper. In Hebrews 10 and verse 12, But this man, speaking of the Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And if you read the first recorded gospel sermon on the day the church started in Acts chapter 2, uh, you will see that Peter follows that outline if you want to call it that when he declares ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the son of God but he then points out that he was raised again and now sits at the right hand of God but the point we're making now is that life is in the blood I think what will be amazing as we go through this is to realize that even in the way God physically created us he was setting up a situation whereby he could teach the importance of the life-giving blood, the spiritual life-giving blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross for our sins. Now, if you compare and contrast our physical blood flowing in our bodies now with the blood shed by Jesus Christ for spiritual benefit, it gets rather amazing. Considering our own blood... Did you know that there are five to seven liters of blood in your body? And that's uh, three or four two-liter soda bottles. That gets about as plain as I know how to say it. In that blood, 
it gets rather interesting to note, and I speak in generalities, that there are many things going on as your heart pumps that blood all around your body, all the way down to the cellular level. The body, of course, is replenished with the needed elements to cause your body to biologically live. It also is removing harmful elements from the body. The blood also helps injured parts of your body. And the blood regulates even the temperature of your body. So the statement that life is in the blood, though there was no scientific terminology or science then when that was said originally as it is today, it is rather an amazing statement when it comes to what really is implied through the research of science when it comes to the physical aspects of us and yet it was stated in a general way so many thousands of years ago. Today medical specialists know that blood performs a remarkable range of functions. And of course it isn't as I said at the beginning a coincidence that uh, spiritually speaking the blood also performs these functions for our spiritual being as well. So for a little while, let's look at the functions of the blood in our physical bodies as compared and contrasted, more compared than contrasted, to the functions of the blood of Christ regarding his spiritual body, which is the church, the kingdom of heaven. First of all, think of the concept of agency, agency. Blood is an agent. It acts as a medium. It does that to transport other things. So also the blood of Christ is an agent. It's the medium whereby we have access to other things. Let's look at those for a moment. Blood replenishes the body the physical body, with needed elements. It carries all kinds of nutrients. It carries oxygen, it carries vitamins, it carries minerals, all sorts of things. The blood of Christ, for the body of Christ, brings us life-giving nutrients as well. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, we find recorded, likewise also the cup referring to the Lord's Supper, after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Now sometimes people ask me, and I pause here to interject this, uh, things, suggestions that as we take the Lord's Supper that will help us focus on the death of Christ. And I might say here again, let's ever keep in mind that the Lord's Supper is to bring back to our memories the suffering and death of Christ, and we're to do that till he come again. Our thoughts are not to be upon the life of Christ. Our thoughts are not to be upon the resurrection of Christ or his ascension to heaven or him establishing the church. It is to concentrate on the suffering to make us aware of what it took to offer forgiveness of sin. And thus we concentrate on the suffering, the anguish, the pain of Christ going through the crucifixion, dying for us. In Psalm 105 and verse 8, we see an interesting message. It tells us what a covenant or a testament actually is. The scripture reads, He hath remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Well, the New Testament, the doctrine, the instruction, the teaching that extends spiritual life to us is so important. No wonder we're taught one way or the other over and over again to study it to meditate on it day and night. In John 6 and verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, 
And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Of course he meant spiritually speaking. He meant I am the one to give you complete forgiveness of every single solitary sin. Thus, when you know that, the guilt of sin and the shame of sin is forever gone from your minds. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Well, why? Well, he tells us, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard from us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. Now the blood of Jesus Christ purchased that covenant, which is God's word, for us today. You see, the New Testament would not be worth a thing if Christ had not shed his blood. And he says, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So no wonder then that you can read uh, the passage of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where Paul writes about all of these spiritual nutrients, if you please, in the spiritual life. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. So just as blood is the agent by which the body, physical body, is supplied with nutrients, so also then the blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. The blood of the New Testament is the agent by which spiritual nutrients are supplied as well. Does this begin to tell you why we preach the word or why we preach the gospel to every creature? Why Jesus commanded the church to do that? And why the gospel is the power of God to save us from sin. Romans 1.16. We also see that blood removes harmful elements from the body. As far as our physical blood is concerned, uh, removes carbon dioxide. It transports the waste from every cell. It fights infections and removes uh, from the body these infections. Uh, it removes excess salt, and so on down the line. Amazing. Well, consider the blood of Christ for the spiritual body of Christ, the church. Because our Lord shed his blood for the remission of our sins, then he has authority to remove harmful elements from the body. In John 17, verses 1 and 2, Jesus prayed. The scripture fully reads uh, these words spake Jesus, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, again you're familiar with this, all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Well, because he has that authority, this power, then he can remove harmful things from you to become a Christian and to remain a faithful child of God in his body, the church. He commands us, it's our responsibility, to remove sinful activities from our lives. In Colossians 3, 5 through 10, Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, as he wrote part, of course, the New Testament, which, remember, is purchased by the blood of Christ. He said, Mortify, put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate, unlawful affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime, when ye lived in them. But now listen. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, 
malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now notice, in the spiritual body of Christ, every member, because that person has been redeemed, forgiven of sins, in their obedience to the gospel, for it was the blood of Christ that was applied to remit their sins, and when? When they were baptized into his death, where the blood was shed. The blood then is applied, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12. And thus our will then is not to will any longer to live as we please. But our will in Christ, since we've been purchased by the blood of Christ, is to make our lives to be in harmony with the mind of God as it's revealed in the words of the New Testament. He also commands that sinful influences be removed from the body. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians 5.11, he says, But now I have written you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, know not to eat. Uh, you know, you can't see the physical body functioning as God created it to function according to the physical laws that govern our biological body. You can't see somebody in his right mind saying, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll have a good meal of arsenic today. But you see, when we have from the heart obeyed the gospel, we have at repentance turned completely away from, from the practice and the habitual activity of sinning. Now we've set our minds on Christ and living according to his last will and testament. And thus we are doing all we can to only feed ourselves with good wholesome things. Because we know if we put poison in our body, that's not according to the will of heaven. Even for the physical body. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, on bending knee I'm begging you, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then who do they serve? Their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple or the innocent. Isn't it interesting to note the protection that the New Testament, purchased by the blood of Christ, provides for the members of the church who have been baptized into the death of Christ where the blood was applied and thus sins remitted by the forgiving power of the blood of the Lamb and our obedience to the gospel, the Lord adds us to the church where the blood of Christ, as it were, spiritually flows. And of course, it's through the New Testament that the nutrients are received that help us be as we ought to be. No wonder doctrine's important. No wonder the gospel is the power of God to save us. But since we're free moral agents, our will is, must be, involved in the matter. No wonder there's more letters written to the members of the church on godly living than there is written concerning how to become a Christian. So it's in Christ where we must let the blood do its work as it were through the truth of the New Testament regarding living as Christ would have us live. We understand that more nowadays when it comes to the physical being of a person. If some of us would take as much care to our spiritual being as we do to our fleshly being, why, we would be superhuman spiritually. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6 states, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Just think of the church as your physical body, because it is the spiritual body of Christ, and every member, every person who's a member of it, a member in particular. Can you see somebody taking their physical body and uh, just abusing it deliberately? But that's what we do, spiritually speaking, when we ignore the teaching of God. Do you care what enters your physical body? 
Well, certainly you do. Do you care what enter, enters the spiritual body of Christ? Do you want just one teeny cancer cell in your physical body? Do you want one teeny spiritual cancer cell in your physical body? If you read these passages, and they're on about a fifth grade level of understanding as far as English is concerned, and you think about that, it'll make a difference as to putting up with sin and overlooking it, ignoring it, and not applying the blood-bought truth of the New Testament to remedying the spiritual body of these sins. Sin is in the church because people in the church commit sin. There's no other way it can happen, brethren. So just as physical blood removes impurities from the physical body, so also the blood of Christ applies the necessary authority to remove the spiritual impurities from the spiritual body of Christ, the church, as well. Blood also repairs injuries to the body. Physical blood as we've said, provides a lot and cleans up a lot of the body. But when the body is injured, you know, it will rush to that injury and it will, with what God's put within it, supply whatever it can do to correcting the problem. In fact, uh, you cut your finger, you cut your leg, or whatever, you'll see the blood rush there and due to the nature of the blood, It'll eventually coagulate, all things working like it should. It'll be around, and say, the, the, the cut. And uh, that will cause the blood to stop flowing because you can't lose but so much. And uh, you lose you. So God's even made the body to function that way. And this works regarding the various organs of the body, the bones, and other portion of our body when they get injured. And the result, ultimately, all things working as they should, is the restoration of the members of the body. Well, that's physically. What about the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular? Well, it's sin that damages and injures the body of Christ. Let me ask you this. Is there anything but sin that can injure the church of the Lord? Now, think about it. Well, is there... Anybody but members of the church who can sin. And unless unbelievers are persecuting the members of the church, then that's the only way they can bring hurt to the church in the sense of tormenting members or persecuting them in some way or causing their death. But you see, spiritually is what we're looking at. There is not a persecutor of the church who can hurt the church ultimately. And it's the doctrine purchased by the blood of Christ that tells us don't fear him. Who can destroy your physical body. But you fear God who can cast both into hell. So the blood repairs injury created by prejudice. Ephesians 2 and verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus who sometimes were far off. Uh, we who sometimes were far off are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. So in the church you've got different ethnic backgrounds. Different this, different that. But when you're following the will of Christ, you're putting into practice the teaching of the Bible, you recognize that you've all been reconciled into one body by the Christ. And regardless of what nationality you are or ethnic background, we're all one in Christ. The blood of Christ helps repair injuries to the body by providing forgiveness to those who seek it. We're always concerned about how to help the nation but the ultimate help of this nation is the ultimate help of anybody. The gospel is the only thing that really can help them. Ultimately, finally, and eternally. It's the gospel. The greatest thing we can do for this nation is live godly lives where we are and use every opportunity we can to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. This blood repairs injury created by sin. In Ephesians 1, 7 and Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, uh, the idea is taught in both of those verses. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Brethren, there's no way in the world that people who are faithful Christians. Red and yellow, black and white. When they hear the gospel. 
are going to be prejudiced one toward another. It's just not going to happen. Or whether you're rich or you're pure. Because you're mindful of the reconciliation we all have in Christ through believing and obeying the same gospel. The blood will not repair an injury, however, of which one is unwilling to repent. Hebrews 10, 26. That's the reason that the faithful members, upon doing what the New Testament of Christ says to members who are adamant in their sin, and uh, they will not repent, the body's got to get away from that sin. Now, I'll just use this. It won't bother Sonia any. But why was everybody so concerned about her father and getting that cancer out of his system? Not that big around. He's a lot bigger fella than that. Why not just leave it alone? Don't hear all this stuff. You know, just pretend it's not there and it'll go away. Isn't that stupid? That's the only proper word for that. Isn't that a stupid way of thinking? But we do it with the church all day long. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. When you know God says, here is the remedy. Uh, I know better than that. Not that important. And you know what's happened. You have willfully rejected the remedy. And yet it comes from the New Testament. But it's the blood of Christ on the cross that gave us our New Testament. It makes it effective. In Luke 17, 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. I don't think that's hard to understand. But it shows that it begins with a private matter. Let's suppose that it's between just two brethren and God and those two brethren. Now get that in your heads. God and those two brethren are the only ones who know about this sin. And one of their brothers has sinned against the other brother. If you're faithful and that happens, it'll never be known any further. It'll stop right there. Because the brother who knows about it will go to the brother who sinned and they'll correct it. Now it's a possibility the brother who sinned didn't even realize for sure what all he had done because he may have sinned in ignorance. But the other brother who loves his soul seeks to keep it that way and they both settle the matter right there. That's the way it ought to be. So just as physical blood repairs injury to the body, so also the blood of Christ repairs injury through repentance and forgiveness, and it will not do it in any other way. This is God's process, spiritually speaking, of the coagulation in spiritual matters of the blood of Christ to heal the wound. Blood regulates the temperature of the body. Physical blood aids in keeping our body temperature, and we know all this, normal le levels. It cools us off. Have you ever gone out working in the yard in July, August, sometime in there, and just got so hot, and then have you stood at the sink, turned the faucets on, and just let the water out of the tap, cold water, cool, whatever, run over your wrists? Have you ever noticed how quickly you will cool off compared to just sitting down in the shade of the tree. Now why? Because all the blood in your body is going to be running through those wrists. And they're pretty close to the surface. Now if you really want to cool off, stick both feet in a pan of water and let it run. And you'll be surprised how quickly it'll change things. Why? Because the blood's running through there and being cool and it's going to the rest of the body. Now that just is so simple. It's just so simple. So it turns into the body, it cools the internal organs, especially cooling the brain. And uh, this is what happens when our body gets overheated. In fact, our heart rate, rate will increase to carry that blood as it cools down to all the parts of the body. Well, Christ's blood provides for the, the cooling, put it in quotes, the cooling of the body of Christ. And it does that because um, the Bible teaches we ought to love one another. What all does that mean for David Brown to love you? What do you expect of me if I as a Christian, a part of your spiritual body, what do you expect of me if I'm to love you like the New Testament says brothers and sisters 
or to love you. Now, whatever it is, make sure you have the authority of the Lord, thus the right to expect that of me. But now remember, I have the right to expect that of you in your biblical actions toward me too. And the truth of the matter is, it's what we all have a right to expect of one another. And that's very, very important. Ha have you ever seen some people deal with the problem and then here's somebody else deals with the same problem one deals with the problem like I'm so sorry this happened this way and I just hate it has to be dealt with but we'll do what's right the other one says hot dog found another one drag him out now and stone him then we'll start the search otherwise you don't think those two attitudes don't exist and those who claim to serve God then you haven't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about how the Pharisees dealt with people. It's not by accident that's there to show us what to be and how to be it and what not to be in taking care of a problem. That's very important to understand. Have you ever heard the saying, give them the benefit of a doubt? Do you know what that means? I bet everyone here, an so adult, has used that terminology. Well, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Is that saying, well, the guy's in sin. We've got 50 people watched him do what he did. Uh, let's just give him another chance. That's not what that means. That means maybe I've misread this. Uh, let's, let's make sure we have all of the facts in the case. Let's make sure we understand what's going on. Let's make sure we know the background of things before we draw our conclusion. We do that when we're studying whatever matter it is that we study. We preach it all the time. When you study the Bible, learn how to write and divide it, get all of what the Bible teaches on that subject in its proper context before you begin to reason and draw your conclusion. Brethren, don't do that with one another, I'm sorry to say. If they see a certain thing going on, man alive, they just know that person is doing it because they love to do sin and they just want to practice it and that's all that they're just going to... Where did you learn that thought process from the teaching of the Lord's will? You know, there's a cancer of the blood, and it begins when it happens to attack the good things. And thus, if a person's not dealt with medically, uh, and that get that thing turned around, then it'll, it'll attack the good parts of the body and kill you. Sometimes think we have uh, leukemia of the body of Christ. And that's the bad news. It's interesting over the years, and I personally have witnessed it over and over again. Uh, people see a sin in a person's life, and they're right. They're sin in that person's life. They can see it, but they can't see other sins in their own life. And the leukemia starts to work. That's bad news, and the Lord had a whole lot to say about me finding something in your life, and I'm right, you have sinned, but you can't see sin in your own life. The Lord said, their eyes they have closed. That means by their own will, they choose to see what they want to see, and since you can't possibly see, you can't afford to admit that there's these sins in your own life, then let's just... Let's pick on Buddy. Everybody look at Buddy's sins. See, that, I won't, you won't be looking at my sins if I can get the spotlight on you. That can certainly happen. It sometimes happens when we, we don't even fully realize that we've done that to ourselves. And that's bad news. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, died for us. In 1 John 4, 10 through 11, John wrote, Herein is love. John's fixing to show us love. Herein is love. Not, not that we love God. We didn't. But that He loved us. And while we were yet enjoying our sins and rebelling against Him, He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now listen. Listen to this conclusion. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. 
Because we love one another, there needs to be in our lives the actions of love in our lives. Paul wrote in Romans 10, or 12, rather, verses 9 through 16, Let love be without dissimulation. We don't use that word more. Right? Look at New King James. You'll see it means hypocrisy. You mean they had problems in those days of members being hypocritic in the application of their love? Evidently they did. He says, don't let it happen. So I have responsibility not to let it happen. Abhor that which is evil. Well, you see, that works well when I can abhor that which is evil in your life. But there's evil maybe in my life, and if I'm to abhor it in your life, I must abhor it in my life as well. Cleave to that which is good. Stick to the good in your life and in everybody else's life. Now watch. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Do you find it hard to prefer another member of the church over you? In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. That's a novel idea. Bless them which persecute you. I'd really rather not. I'd rather knock the daylights out of somebody that persecutes me now when I have that thought in my mind that's when I know I need to regulate David Brown I need to know that's not the will of Christ I need to look to the example of Christ and I need to let him have his way with me bless and curse not rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. Sometimes we sing the song and sorrow flows from out of eye. No, we know what we're singing, but we're saying when my brother or sister hurts, I hurt. When they rejoice, I rejoice. He says simply, be of the same mind one toward another. Uh, you better think about the implications of that. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. Now here's a hard one. But condescend to men of low estate. They're humble and meek. And be not wise in your own conceits. First of all, you have to admit you are conceited before you can be not wise in it. And that's a big step within itself. Just as our physical blood regulates the temperature of our bodies, so also the precious blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness or remission of our sins. The blood of the New Testament the blood that makes the gospel, the glad tidings of Christ, powerful to save. By showing his love toward us, helps us to regulate ourselves among our brothers and sisters who are the other members of the spiritual body of Christ. Let me ask you this. Would you die the kind of death Christ died on behalf of any brother or sister in this auditorium? much less somebody that denies the existence of God, the deity of Christ, and actively and consistently persecutes Christians. Christ did. Life is in the blood. Long ago as the unfolding of the scheme of redemption was taking place, God made it clear to Israel about the importance of the blood of those doves and those sheep and so on he made sure they understood it was not a common matter you can't eat it because he knew where he was going to when his son would come to earth die on the cross of calvary shedding his blood for the remission of sins the blood of the new testament for the life is in the blood and forgiveness of, st of sins is extended to us of the precious blood of jesus christ I hope such as this helps us when we concentrate on the bread representative of the body of Christ sacrificed on the cross for our sins and the blood shed from that body on the cross of Calvary 
to purchase us from our sins. Jesus purchased the church to them with his blood, Acts 20 and 28. We as members of that church should show forth that kind of love and appreciation for all the others who have done what's right in obedience to the gospel. We should uphold Christ as the example of dealing with sin and we should do our best to walk in his steps that we might not sin ourselves. Blood has then many functions. It serves to replenish nutrients, remove waste, repair injury, regulate the temperature of the Christ, or rather of the body of Christ. So also, the blood of Christ serves then in, as I concluded there a moment ago, in a spiritual way, to provide these functions for the church, the spiritual body of Christ. What a thought there is in there's life in the blood. Said so many years ago in Leviticus 17 11, long before the fullness of it was a reality in the life and death of Jesus Christ wherein he shed his blood for all men. Are you subject to the precious gospel call of the Christ? If you would be a Christian, you must believe with all of your heart, according to the scriptures, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Romans 10, 17, John 8, 24. You must continue your obedience to the plan of salvation and fully repenting of all sin, Acts 17, 30. You must be willing to confess your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10, and Matthew 10, verse 32. And you must complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized for the remission of your sins by the authority of Christ and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins. In that way, and in that way only, is the blood of Christ applied to you that it can take away all sin so that the Lord may add you to his spiritual body where the blood flows, the blood of Christ that you might be faithful when you stand before him in the final day when this world is no more. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we bid you come while we stand and sing.